Hey everybody, welcome to Performance Anxiety, proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network, and I am your host, Mark. And before we get started, I want to thank our sponsor, AKG, for sending us their Podcaster Essentials Kit. It comes with incredibly comfortable headphones and an amazing Lira mic. Beth Jeans Houghton, aka Du Blonde, joins the show. We talk about the value of free shoes, week-long constipation, and bootlegging your own records. Her mom has a bath, while we also discuss making videos for Ezra Furman and the Red Hot Chili Peppers, creating video games, and the 2,000-year-old computer. We swap childhood phone numbers, and in between all these hilarious tangents, we talk about her career from the beginning all the way to the new Dublonde album, Homecoming. It's a great album that everyone really needs to check out. Pick it up at dublonde.co.uk, follow Dublonde on social media, follow us at Performance ANX. And if you like the show, rate and review it. That actually helps us get in front of more ear holes. You can get us a cup of coffee, no commitment, at ko-fi.com slash performance anxiety. Merch is found at performanceanx.threadless.com. Now take a deep breath and let's dive right into Du Blonde on Performance Anxiety, part of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Trust me, she'll love it. Okay. <laughs> um, this is Du Blonde. Um, my human name is Beth. <laughs> and uh, I'm here to... Oh, this is awful. <laughs> I'm here to talk about my album Homecoming, which is out April 2nd, which B might be in the past already. So it's too late. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's called Homecoming. I'm really excited to put it out. And you are listening to Performance Anxiety. Oh, baby. Yeah. 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 Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm trying to take my shoes off as I'm oh, doing what, this here. That's, what shoes that's, are you I'm wearing? I'm not doing anything weird. I promise. <laughs> shoe oh green yes nice. free too so <gasps> free green shoes that's great how, how come they were free <laughs> a buddy of mine does a lot of these spartan runs uh-huh and he's apparently pretty good at them so he gets free shoes from companies like brooks and reebok and stuff and we're the same shoe size so the yeah. ones he either doesn't like or is only worn like once he's like you want them Yes, I will take free shoes all the time. I will also always take free shoes. <laughs> my my favorite pair of shoes I ever owned, I got for free, and I hated them when I got them, but I had no money, so I was just like, well, my old ones broke. And then I didn't realize they had, like, memory foam insoles. Ooh. It's so comfortable. And then since then, like, I, I had to, like, track two pairs down to try and buy them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining me. This is great. I've uh, been listening to the new album and it's so cool. Yay. I'm glad you like it. It is awesome. And I want to get into it pretty, pretty deep. But okay. before we do that, I want to find out how you, you got to that point. So I want to find out a lot about your musical past. And I know that both your parents were graphic designers. Yeah. So did they have like artistic musical inclinations as well? Was there a lot of music in the house? And there was, what yeah. Kind? So there was always a record collection, which is actually right behind me. This is my, my childhood bedroom I'm in that my <laughs> mom then turned into her office. Wow. Um, but there was, I would say, about 20 LPs. And then I think I was about like six or seven and my mom played um, uh, Ladies of the Canyon by jo uh, Joni Mitchell. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And she played it on vinyl. And I remember, because I'm in like a, I was born in 1990. So I was like, what's this? God. Like a big black CD. <laughs> and then, yeah, it was like, uh, that, that was kind of it. I heard that record and I was just like, this is, I think it, the, obviously amazing music, but the thing that blew my mind was that like someone's voice, Joni Mitchell isn't dead, but like, even if someone's dead, their voice can come out of this like plastic disc. Yeah. It's like mind blowing, and you just don't really think about that with CDs because they kind of disappear into whatever machine, and then the music comes out, and it's, it's just you, you don't think about it. It's a little more sterile than a vinyl. Yeah, exactly, and I think that just sort of like ignited this kind of like desire to like make things like that, and then so it was like a lot of kind of like 
60s west coast stuff um oh. and then when i was 12 my dad played me this frank zappa compilation which i think was called something like have i offended someone or have i offended you <laughs> and it was all of his most like offensive songs oh nice and i heard that and i was like this is fucking amazing that you can have like someone i can swear on this can't i Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> I have to check. I do radio stuff and I have to like hold it in. I'm like, ooh. Um, That's got to be tough. Yeah. For me especially. <laughs> and it was just, I think it was the, the combination of like humor and sarcasm and almost like theater and then also like great pop songs. Um, and then, yeah. And then I got into, when I was about 14, I got into like a uh, psych rock kind of stuff. And I, I used oh, to... Cool. In England, we say skive off school, but I don't know what you guys would call that. Playing hooky. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yep. And uh, yeah, and I used to go and hang out with these guys in their 30s who were all in this kind of like psych rock band. And I'd <laughs> get stoned and listen to their rehearsals. And then that was kind of like the beginning of it all. And I started playing music or like writing songs when I was like 15. Wow. That's pretty early. Do you think I always thought I was so late to it and I was just like, if I'd only begun when I was four, I'd be like, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> you'd be the Mozart. Exactly. Of whatever genre you'd picked. That's all I've ever wanted to be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so were you taking and were you playing any instruments before getting stoned and hanging out with the psych guys or? I, I played, I had like piano lessons when I was like seven and I okay. hated them so much everybody does I, from, yeah. I never got them so i'm just, just lucky I i'm think living vicariously the, through all the people who hated them yeah i just i couldn't stand because i the first thing i learned to play was chariots of fire um and i just wow which i it's a it's a great tune but i used to play it probably at like 300 bpm and my teacher <laughs> was just like this is not my teacher looked like that you know the guy who works in the comic store in the simpsons Oh, yeah. So he was just like that. He was called David. And he used to just get like so pissed at me for playing it really fast. And he was just like, you know, you've got to follow like what it, what it was written to be. And I was just like, fuck that. Why? Why? <laughs> um, and then so I, I quit piano and I hated it. And as soon as I quit, I wrote my first song when I was like 12. Oh, wow. Um, because I could do whatever I wanted. And I, I, I part of starting to write songs was because... I, you know, I was learning guitar and piano and all of this stuff. And I hated that if you're playing someone else's song, you can play it wrong. But if you play your own song, no one can tell you you're doing it wrong. The, it that's a ego great thing. point. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when did you start playing in front of people? Um, I think I played my first show when I was 15. And I... Wow. I <laughs> See early, early. Well, I'm yeah, telling I guess you. so. Looking back at it now, I'm 31 now, and I it's one of those things where I think when you're a teenager, you're like, I am so grown up. Oh and like, yeah, I know. I've got three of them in the house right now. So. Oh goodness, 16, 17, and 18. <sighs> Good luck. Yeah, <laughs> but it's funny because then every every year that passes, you're like, God, I knew nothing. But yeah, oh, yeah, I was super nervous. I was a really shy kid, so when I first started playing shows like it wasn't it didn't come naturally to me at all and i would just have like a panic attack and sweat and like play everything super fast because i i wanted to get through it and then also Including like getting, chariots of fire yeah i just got on stage <laughs> by chariots of fire. <laughs> no. um, and i there was quite a few gigs that i would be either not allowed into or kicked out of the venue because i was underage and then my mum uh, would have to like go up to the bouncer and be like, my daughter's playing a show. <laughs> Your mom sounds awesome. Oh, by she's the way. fucking great. She's my best friend. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That is so great. Yeah. So when did you get serious about music? Because from what I understand, that wasn't your chosen profession. You were going to go a different route. Yeah, I was going to do, I wanted to be like an artist or a fashion designer. And then... Well, I bought a guitar, I started playing shows, and then I also started watching Almost Famous repeatedly. Oh, yeah. And I was like, God, I want to be in a band. And I started listening to more bands like outside of the 60s, of like, like folk rock genre. Um, and I just, it's funny because my first record is, is not super rock. A lot of people thought it was folk and they're wrong. 
Oh, was... okay. So I won't say it was folk. I, let me change my notes. <laughs> Not folk. Not All right. folk. Well, there, you there was some folk elements, but for me, I was just like, there was also kind of like 60s girl group and psych and rock and all of this stuff but yeah and i i just always wanted to be like the front guy in a rock band i don't know i just i was just like god that's so fun Um, well all right i'm gonna gonna give you a quick aside here and plug something for you oh i'm part of a podcast network Uh this shows on pantheon podcast network very fancy i get a little check mark for that but we have a, a show on there. If, you, if you're a big fan of Almost Famous, there's a podcast that goes through the movie minute by minute. <gasps> Every episode, they go through it minute no. by minute. How do yeah, I not called, know about this? I will find it. I'll, I'll text you a link to it. It's called The Almost Famous Minute. Oh, my God. That's so and great. It, if, uh, if you're interested in talking to the guys about it, I will hook you guys up. Yeah! That's excellent. All right. So there you go. <laughs> I would love right. that. Okay. I'm changing my notes now. So again, <laughs> so I can have my own reminder. Hook Beth you. up. That's a weird way to start a sentence. With <laughs> almost famous minute. Okay, cool. Because <laughs> they have guests, uh, guests on there all the time to talk about the show. So this is I'll get you guys all together. Amazing. Okay, so back back to uh, whatever the hell we were talking about. I don't remember where we were. Neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Right. You're starting to focus on music as more than just a hobby or anything. Yeah. So you so you were wanted to be a fashion designer, but you actually you have had your designs on the uh, the catwalk at London Fashion Week, right? Oh no, I was just modeling for that. I have this friend. Oh okay. She's called Pam Hogg. And she's just this incredible designer. I think she began in like the 80s. And I grew up sort of like seeing her designs. And I, it, there's very few actual fashion designers that I'm interested in. But I think I sort of like recognize Pam as having very similar kind of like outlook on life as me. Okay. Um, and then I saw her at a festival once and I was like, oh, I was with my mom. We went to Hop Farm to see uh, Bob Dylan. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh. God, that's Pam Hogg. And then my mom was like, go and talk to her. And I was like, I'm too scared. And then I met her at a party years later. And she's just like, you have to be in my show. Um, wow. And it's completely like modeling is not something that I'm comfortable with or enjoy. See, but Well, I, then I can understand. But I'll tell you what, the, the photos I saw, it, you were great because I thought it was, I didn't recognize it as you in the pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was your design. So that that's that's really wild. Yeah, we, we're super similar and she she's now a friend and we, we go to the same cafe all the time and we both turn up in our like faux fur coats and Adidas leggings. She's just kind of like me in the future. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, you did get a kind of a interesting beginning to your performing career though because you, you had a weird instance with Devendra Banhart. Oh, fuck. Yeah. So what happened there? <laughs> so I was like, um, I think I was like 17 at the time, but when I was 16, I'd gone to one of his shows and I don't know if he still does this, but he used to do this thing where sort of halfway through his show, he'd be like, is there anyone in here who like writes their own songs? who like wants to come and sing a song. And I didn't put my hand up the first time because I was like too scared. And some other guy went and did it. I hope you can't hear that delivery van. I hope the delivery no. van's not for me. Anyway. I've had a lot worse background noise than that. Don't <laughs> I worry about that. Um, yeah, and then so, and I really regretted it because I was like, I was a huge fan of his. Um, and I was like, God, like I, I missed that chance. I have to get over my nerves and everything. And then the year later, we were at this festival called Green Man in Wales. And I think it was about like 10,000 people in the audience. And then he did the thing where he's like, does anyone want to get, and I put my hand up. And then like, I got like pulled out the crowd and I had to like sing this song. And I was like, yeah, I was like 17, wow. terrified. And it was just so, so fun. And it was one of those things where I realized that it doesn't make a difference if you're playing in front of like 10 people or 10,000. Like for me, it's not, it, it's nerve wracking either way. Right. For me, like the nerves didn't get bigger just because there was more people. And then I was kind of like, oh, maybe I can get over this kind of stage fright fear. If that would happen to me, I 
I okay. This, maybe this is weird, but I would imagine, and because I've never done that, I've never. I play really crappy guitar, Love and that. I can't sing worth a damn. That's so great. I don't even I don't even try. Neither can Bob Dylan, really. But well, hey, anybody <laughs> can Bob Dylan. I can't write like him, but I can perform like him. <laughs> there you go. But to me, it, I have been on a stage with a lot of people as a photographer. Yeah. And looking out into that, it's it almost seems kind of abstract. There's yeah. just so many people. It's like they're not even people. That's the thing. It's if it's more people than you can count in just one glance, then it's just kind of like whatever. And most of the time, either you can't see people's faces because they're so far back, or it's dark. And I think that's kind of like the savior for. I think a lot of musicians are not sociable people, and even if they come across as like eccentric and confident on stage, most of them are just like loner nerds who don't like people. Yeah. Um, right. So it's <laughs> and like that a comes across job. as cool. Yeah, yeah. It's a funny job to to get into if you're someone like me. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So how did you get into it as a job then? You recorded um, your first EP. Yeah, I recorded my first EP with this guy called Adam. He used to be in a band called Fridge with Kieran Hebden of, fuck, what's his, his music name? Fortet. Oh, oh, yeah. Fortet's awesome. So I was, I think I was probably like 17 or 18 at that time. And that was just a really, he had like a studio in his house and his house at the time was like this big, it was an old warehouse that I used to think, like it was like a textile mill or something. Oh, wow. So I went and stayed with him and his wife for a few days. Slow down for me, take me out to the street so I can see what you call a perfect love. Drive past my house, but it drives me mad. I'm so glad that I had you, but now you're gone too. And I'm lost for words again. Can we just pretend? And uh, we recorded, and it was, it was the first time I'd kind of like seen the technical side of like recording and stuff. And then so I got um, Pro Tools and stuff when I got home. Oh wow. Um, that was the, it's funny, I don't think of, because usually when I think of like my first record, I don't think of that EP, I think of the first, like the Yours Truly Cellophane Nose record. But that was probably, yeah, the beginning of that. And then just through like playing shows, um, I just met like a bunch of people. It just kind of happened quite naturally. It wasn't like, um, I think most of, I think probably the first three years I was just kind of doing something for fun. And then every time there was an opportunity, I was like, oh my God, amazing. But it wasn't. Kind of like when I started smoking, I thought I was a social smoker for about four years. So I realized <laughs> I was like sneakily buying tobacco behind my mum's back. I was like, I've got an issue. <laughs> nice. I, I've never, I never got into that. But I was thinking about starting with the patch though and just like easing my way into it that way. I'm actually using a patch right now. I, I quit three years, three months ago and I, I was a smoker for 18 years. Wow. Yeah. Man. Yeah. That, I, Gave up liquor for Lent, so that's I thought that's that's hard enough. How's it going? It I've been good. Good. I've been very good. I have had one drink, but with with my dad, so that's fine. So once Easter gets back to it, <laughs> that's the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> but right, so the first EPs were were pretty much just you, just me, yeah. And you've got some really cool stuff on there, like. Hey, that's no way to say goodbye. Oh, I yeah. will return. I promise. Pretty Please. shoes is beautiful, by the way. I oh my god, you've that. done so much research. This is like a whole <laughs> nother lifetime for me. Running home and I'm done with you. Your jaded smile and your pretty shoes. You're that much stronger than I can lose, but I lost you. Night Swimmer, you recorded that, and, but you also recorded that with Hose of Destiny, and, and it, yeah. you know, progressed. Mm -hmm. So, what was, why did you change from being solo to being part of a band? Um, 
it, mostly it was just because the the recorded music had so much on it that playing live I was just like I need to I've always struggled with this throughout my life of like well do I record something that I know I can play live or but I wasn't really thinking about it at the time so I put like a bunch of different instruments on it and I didn't want to go out and just play kind of like an acoustic version of that without the stuff okay um, okay so the who's the destiny were all musicians from from newcastle and yeah it's it kind of like a necessity thing and i really like playing with people and it it helped my confidence a lot on stage because the onus isn't just on you to carry the show right so yeah it's helpful spread it around a bit yeah blame the rest <laughs> exactly it was you so did, yeah your fault <laughs> I always blame the bassist yeah yeah, I do. <laughs> I don't. I don't. So how did you come up with the name Hooves of Destiny? That's <laughs> that so was, weird. I, I can't even remember. It began, it was a total joke. I think that we were kind of like, because at first it was just, you still, it, it was just like Beth Jean's Houghton. And then there was these musicians who were playing with me. And at some point I was just like, you guys should have your own name because i'm like i'm super into you know like the the 50s and 60s sort of like band names like okay i can't think of an example now but you know like johnny whoever in the in the what's it question mark in the mysterions yes <laughs> um and so yeah that was that was that and i think it just came about as a joke and there was a lot of stuff like our press release at the time we wrote this like terrible biography which was just like totally <laughs> sarcastic and at the time i was like yeah this is funny and now, like, looking back, I'm like, holy fuck. And sometimes people will still use the press release from when I was 16 for, like, Du Blonde Records. And I'm like, I wish I'd never written Oh, my written God. That. <laughs> so cringy. I kind of wish I had found that. I'd, I'd be pulling stuff out of that. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to that album, Your Truly Cellophane Knows. Interesting yeah. title, by the way. And you've got some awesome stuff on there. I think my favorite track is the Barely Skinny Bone Tree. Wow. Your feathers breathe, separate like curdled words. Your mother made to nine your house. The walls that you I love that song. I mean, Thank you, you redid uh, Night Swimmer, which was also cool. Yeah. But like Dodecahedron. And I like the, uh, the little hidden track at the end of Carousel. Oh, yeah. What is, <laughs> all right, so what is that? Because that, that's a lot different than a lot of it's the It's a lot album. different. Okay. So when, when everyone got their knickers in a twist about my <laughs> going like rock or whatever, I was just like, well, look at the last track on yours truly cellophane known, which was just like a pure kind of like punk sort of two minute thing that was yeah. written about. So I have this um, friend called Ben Corrigan and he was in a punk band called Thatron Acid. Um, okay. And also he's in a band called Hard Skin. So he was my, my tour manager for a long time. And there was one time we were in kind of like a travel lodge and we, do you have travel lodges in the U.S.? I just kind of like a shitty yeah. chain motel. Oh yeah, yeah. Which I love. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we were kind of like we were checking in, and there was this there was this guy who was like super drunk, and I think he was like this Glaswegian guy, and I think that he was um maybe like a builder or something, but he's kind of like visiting the town for work or whatever, and he got super drunk, and he tried to start this fight with Ben, who <laughs> might look unassuming, but it's just like he'll knock you out. Oh, wow. Um, and then it was just this, like, <laughs> we were all just kind of like these young kids just, like, standing by watching this, like, to and fro of these two guys, like, arguing, trying not to get physical. <laughs> and then, um, and I can't remember exactly what it, what it was that he said, but I think that Ben was just like, fuck off or something. And he's just like, my, my name's not fuck off. My name's Sean. And then, uh, <laughs> and then at the end, um, there was some kind of, like, uh, goodbye, good night, and fuck off. Whatever the lyric is. Right. Um, so <laughs> yeah. I kind of like I kind of wrote that song as an ode to Ben and his punk self. 
um and then we had him come in and sing on that track on the record that's awesome so for me that was like i i love that record but it's really not um the kind of music like i i want to play now but right. that playing that last track was like the what's it called that song i don't know because it goes like, from what i heard it just says carousel and then there's a gap and then that plays some i think it's called like fuck off aka sean or something <laughs> uh, <laughs> i'll see if i can pull it up somehow but yeah i don't know goodness my memory i'm getting old um yeah. <laughs> but yeah it was just like that was the most fun to record and because we did it last i think that was like what clicked in my head of like no no this is what i want to record and what i want to play live and then so I almost immediately started writing like rock and punk tracks, but because my first album didn't come out for five years, it was this kind of thing where when it came out, it was new to everybody else. But for me, I was like totally over it already. Oh, wow. Um, so then I had to do kind of like this two year touring cycle of, of just playing those songs and, and it was fun and I liked it, but I was just like really roaring to get the old overdrive out. To get rocking. Yeah. All right. Yeah, all right. So I'm pulling it up. I, it, yeah, it just says carousel. <gasps> oh, it's a mystery. So the, yes. Oh, it's a really, it's a mystery when the composer doesn't even remember the name of it. Yeah. <laughs> just testament <laughs> to my brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you decide to go and, and start playing some heavier music with Dublon. So, so to me... You're going like the opposite of people. A lot of people, as their careers go on, they get softer and softer, and you're doing the exact opposite. <laughs> well, yeah, I kind of, well, because I'd, I'd been, I think because the, the record was delayed for like five years, which is the reason I think everyone should just self-release instead of going with record labels. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then so, yeah, I was just sort of so, so ready to, to do all of that stuff. And I'd, we'd actually gone out to LA to make a kind of second Beth Jean's Hartman and the Who's Destiny record. And it was just kind of at the point where I think like a lot of the guys in the band wanted more say in, because previously like I'd written like most of the parts and it was always like my stuff and they played with me. Um, right. But it was moving much more into a direction where I like lost control over. It didn't, it wasn't even my music anymore really. Um, uh, so then I was just like, I've got to go solo. Um, so I did. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. How did you come up with Du Blonde? <laughs> this was, uh, I have this friend called Kyle in LA who's this like Texan comedian. Um, and he used to just like, you know, funny people often have kind of like little kind of like skits and stuff that they do just among friends. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, he, I think like Dublon was his version of my like Texan alter ego. <laughs> He'd be like, Dublon. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I was like, I, I went through like a period where I was getting loads of kind of like shit from people online just like nasty like death threats and stuff oh and my then, gosh yeah and then so i changed my my personal facebook name to dublon so that people couldn't find me and then yeah i had to think of a new name and i went through a list of like 30 names and like all of the ones i loved had already been taken which is just that old you know give it a google yeah. and you're like oh here's five bands already called milk yeah, <laughs> yeah. and then uh yeah, I was just like, oh, I'll just go with Dublon because I, I like that it didn't mean anything. It's just kind of like a short name. Um, yeah. Yeah. Most of my records, the titles don't have anything to do with the, the album. Well, you're very good at, at the unusual titles because <laughs> they're, they are definitely different. They all, they all have a story. I mean, Homecoming, this new one is the first one that's just one word. I was going to ask you about that. That same seems normal, uh, yeah. compo you know, compared to like, was it Welcome Back to Milk? Welcome Back to Milk was because I used to work in this cafe and there was, uh, there was one time I'd been constipated for about a week oh. um, and I was working with this guy and he was just like, yeah, but you know, you're lactose intolerant. And I was like, yeah. And he's just like, well, just drink a bunch of milk. 
And then, uh, <laughs> so he made me like a, a coffee with like cow milk. And then when he passed it to me, he said, welcome back to milk. And I was like, nice. that is the name of my next album. <laughs> <laughs> same, that with, is... same with that Lung Bread for Daddy as well. Okay, so I was going to ask about that. Right. So, all right, so how does that, okay. how did that come about? Well, so I, for quite a few years, I had a, um, a drummer called Jacob, who's from Copenhagen. And I get, I, I, this may be wrong, but I'm assuming that maybe in Copenhagen they call tobacco lung bread. No. Oh. Um, and then we all used to have this thing on tour where we kind of each had like a family member name. So like I was baby that my, uh, there was like a different, everyone was kind of like mum, dad, this kind of thing. And Jacob okay. was daddy. <laughs> and then so we were walking along one time and he just wanted a cigarette and he said, baby, do you have any lung bread for daddy? Cause, and I was just like, that's it. <laughs> so it just always kind of happened where it was like a friend would say some bizarre sentence and I'd get four words out of it that just seemed like a good album title. <laughs> that is awesome. To me, I mean, it, it, it's, it's such, they're hilarious. Because to me, it conjures up visions of congestion. Yes. Like, like a lung clam. Totally. I mean, for, for lung bread for the daddy, I was I was so pleased with because it's so disgusting. Yeah. It's so uncomfortable. I think like calling anyone daddy is just so like. Oh. Yeah, it's a little creepy. <laughs> yeah. Unless they're your actual, it's your actual child. It's yeah. a little weird. So it's just kind of like just all kinds of ways to make people feel uncomfortable. If I can get that into a title, I'm happy. Well, it, it, you know, it kind of fitting. I mean, you do have a song called Sinusitis. So. I do. I do. <laughs> That's something so that, I have to deal with a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so your career is based on post-nasal drip. Yeah, pretty much. I actually only just found out what that is. <laughs> because I had that like a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, I what is it called when you have like a cold and it's not dribbling out the front, it's dribbling out the back. Yep. Post nasal drip. Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, so if you see me doing this, going, <clears throat> <laughs> you're swallowing your That's, phlegm. I'm, I'm getting lung bread for daddy. <laughs> Ugh, that's terrible. Gross. All right, so there. <laughs> I think this is the first time I've grossed out a guest. <laughs> oh no, I'm not. I'm not grossed out. Okay, I'm ungross outable. <laughs> good. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, wait till you see this. Um, <laughs> So there's like a there's a four year gap between uh, milk and lung bread. So, yeah. what was was there a reason for the gap, or was it like a more label issues? Label or? issues. Ah. So I've gone completely. Did, I'm self releasing completely now. I made my own label. I'm so sick of it. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm getting that feeling, here. and, and <laughs> it's a, it's a common thing that I'm hearing with guests. Is it? Know, I wondered. I think I think a lot of stuff is changing at the moment which makes me feel really happy is that i think people so first of all i think there are really good record labels and i think that some artist record label relationships really work for them and that's super great and some people need more help with i'm lucky because i do everything myself so right. like i i can sort out my you know the graphic design music videos all of this stuff and other people don't do that and they could benefit from some help with that and that's totally great but there's just i think people are starting to realize that they don't need a, a relationship with a label and i think that oh, the, yeah. the amount of opportunities there are like online and with streaming which i also have a, a good bad relationship with um, oh yeah <laughs> but yeah I, I i think people are sort of like opening their eyes to the fact that it's not the be all and end all to have a label and that's really yeah yeah, I mean, it, great services like Bandcamp. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm using Bandcamp at the moment. I'm also using a um, a label services company, which I would recommend to anyone. Oh, so what's they, that? They kind of, they do everything the label would do, but they take less of a percentage and they don't own your rights, which to me is the really big thing, yeah. um, is the, the owning of, of your work. Because really, as a musician... That, that's all you have. And yeah. so I work with this guy called Brad, who's super lovely, and he just sort of does all of the bits I'm not too hot on, like, you know, getting the music on Spotify and Apple Music and, like, sorting out distribution, that kind of thing. So there's there's definitely, like, a load of options. Like, doing it yourself doesn't 
necessarily have to mean like you do everything yourself. It's just a different approach where you retain your right. Okay. The boring side uh, of it. <laughs> so speak. No, no, no. This is this. I love getting into this stuff. Okay. <laughs> So speaking of a different approach, you did take a different approach when you started to do blonde yeah. because yeah. it's definitely a lot uh, more of a lo-fi indie sound yeah, than yeah. the stuff you're doing with Hose of Destiny. Yeah. And it's, it's really cool. It's, you've Aww. got noisy guitars, the psych sound, the occasional stoner vibe, yeah. you know, songs like Baby Talk. Yeah, There's, yeah, yeah, yeah. cool stuff oh, I'm so um, raw cool. honey i love raw honey oh you do oh yeah that, that sounds great i just I mean, got so and, high then but the, what's really cool is you, you take this like this indie lo-fi vibe but you also have these big you get a big sound out of lo-fi like yeah. uh, like sounds like uh, isn't it wild oh, very yeah, ballady yeah, yeah. but it's a but it's a it's a that indie was sounding super lo-fi that that one i just did in my computer in la and we tried to wow. re-record it properly and it just wasn't working so i was just like let's just stick the demo on it yeah, that's my granddad talking at the start of that one. Oh, is that okay yeah i was oh, asking that's awesome. him what i was just like you know what do you think happens like after death do you believe in god like all of this stuff i interviewed both my grandparents for like four days because i was like he won't be around forever and they were such great pa great parents well they were great parents yeah. not to yeah. me <laughs> 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 fuck you yeah. um, <laughs> no they were super great and i just kind of i was like one of my they were such good storytellers and such great lovely people and it was just like you know what's your advice for young people and they were like travel and then they're like if you don't like your job if possible change it just like all of this like really good solid like non-judgmental advice that's great. I mean, because yeah. you get to the point where I'm at, if you don't like your job, you're kind of stuck. Are you, though? Oh, I got that's three not kids to, about to hit college. That's not to minimize it and say that it's so, not easy. That's true. Yeah. yeah I can do it, yeah. but I don't know if I'm going to. Anyway. That's okay. all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so some of the lyrics in, the, in your song sound fairly... They're either autobiographical yeah, or they have definitely have a genuine story behind them. Like, I think, is it Raw Honey where the lyrics are take a trip up, trick, take a trip up north to Mother Dew? No, no, Malibu. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna. All right, so I'm gonna edit this. So that's coming out. All right, let me reframe this. Are any of the lyrics autobiographical or have genuine stories? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they all are. And I, yeah, because I see, I've seen like a, you know, there's a lot of musicians who, my friend Ezra Furman, for example, she writes really amazing songs that maybe they're partly autobiographical, but she's very good at like, in the same way, like Bruce Springsteen tells like a story and it's yeah. about a couple, you know, going about their day and one and one is a murderer or something. Right. Um, <laughs> and I've never <laughs> been good at that because I feel like I'm so like a, this sounds super cringy, but like I'm so emotionally involved in what I'm singing that I don't feel like I could um, sing about something I didn't know about. Okay, that um, makes sense. And it's also been like very therapeutic for me in my terrible mental health journey to like be able to put stuff into a song like i always felt whether i was putting something into a song or into a painting or whatever i just kind of encapsulate it in that thing and then it's done and i can kind of walk away from it okay. you know in therapy where they're like give me your saddest moment put it in a box and i'll take it and like you leave it there or whatever <laughs> so it's just like that kind of thing okay um, yeah 
You've also done some graphic work. How did you get into that? And, and are you still doing that? Yeah. Because I know you, you did do a, a really cool video for, you, you done, you done one for Ezra Furman, yeah. Red Hot Chili Peppers, and a bunch of others. Yeah, yeah. Well, so um, that was kind of like, when I was like a kid, my, my, we weren't allowed uh, computer games or video games, me and my brother. And um, my mom just taught us kind of like Photoshop and Illustrator. Okay. So I can remember when I was like six or seven, I used to draw on Illustrator or InDesign. I would draw these figures and then I would draw like different hairstyles. And then because they're on different layers, I'd be like, no, she's got pink hair. And like, <laughs> now she's wearing a bikini. Um, and there was a point when I was doing the Chili Peppers video where I was just like, oh my God, this is just like a glorified version of like my six-year-old fun and games. <laughs> But so yeah, I, it was now just, getting paid for it. Now I'm getting paid for it. Well, not not during the pandemic, but yeah. So that was yeah, that was all, always something I did, and I've always done the like artwork and stuff for my records, and and I'm really lucky to have um kind of like a side thing that I do that is still creative because I could not last in an office. Yeah. I just fucking <laughs> I didn't think so either. Yeah. <laughs> but you also created a video game. Yeah, I did. Oh. How, did, so how did that happen? And wh what's the video game about? <laughs> okay. This this is super fun because I've actually, I've had to put the video game on hold work because I've been in Newcastle for a year with my mom and I I built this like hyper speedy PC to like build the video game on and that's in oh, cool. London so I can't get to it. Um, oh, wow. But so the video game... All I can remember is I was walking, Some sometimes I'll just get an idea and I don't know where it comes from, but I was walking along the street in London, I was on the phone to my mum, and I think we were talking about like me wanting to learn Spanish, and then all of a sudden I was just like, I want to build a, a video game where like each island has like different tracks from the record and blah, blah. so I cut her off, and then I... <laughs> I, I was like, bye, <laughs> leave me alone. Yeah. And then I called um, my friend Zach, who I have to tell you about Zach. He's amazing. Yeah. So I met Zach in a car when I was in LA and um, I someone had just mixed Lung Bread for Daddy. Okay. It wasn't very good. It was just one of those things where you're like super excited to get the mixes back. And then, oh, no, no. So it was like mixed or mastered. No, it was mastered. And it came back and I was like, oh, my God, it sounds so like a lot of um, like mixing engineers and mastering engineers will try and like compress everything. So everything sounds loud. But like with my right. stuff, it's super dynamic. So I want the quiet bits to be really quiet and allowed to be really loud. Right. Um, and then Zach and his then girlfriend had picked us up and we were just talking and I was saying like, oh, I just got these masters back and it's super. And then his girlfriend was just like, well, Zach's a master, eh? and I was like, "What?" Um, wow. So um, I'm going off off the uh, subject here. Anyway, that's all right. So you can cut all that out if it. Um, <laughs> so I got Zach to master the record. I'd never heard anything he'd done, but I just had this feeling, and he saved it, and I loved it so much. And then we just sort of start. We were just like really good friends because we have a lot in common. We're both kind of like into like spirituality and technology and then so and he also was really into teaching himself how to code oh this cool. is where we got the video game so i called zach and i was like do you want to make a video game and he was like yeah wow so i put like a very tiny budget together and then i taught myself how to kind of like 3d model and like i created the avatar um wow. and then we just we did it all using like free um software I'm saying this because more people than they know can probably build a video game and they didn't realize they could. So I want more people like myself who has never played video games to just go and make shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, so like it's it's called Garden Boy and the you play as like an avatar of me and I'm like butt naked but wearing like a cowboy hat. <laughs> I'll send you a clip of it later. Yeah. And, and, then, and then so like you can run or fly and it's all of these like CGI islands, but like super tropical. It's kind of like based a bit on LA and there's like water you can like fly into and it goes like splash. Um, <laughs> just that, As water will do. Yeah. And then we put kind of like a, a nature sound thing in the background. And I was just like, it was really um, relaxing making it. And I was just like, it'd be lovely if this was just like, 
a game that people could play where it's just kind of like is explorative a word like yeah i think so um yeah yeah. and then we just kept like adding stuff and i was like look you can like do this and we can do that and just sort of like it was both of us you know he'd never coded like a game before um he had to learn like c sharp and stuff Um, oh wow and then between us he was in la and i was in london and we'd just be on the phone every day being like if you type in like whatever hashtag whatever this thing happens and this object will stick to this object oh neat yeah so i do i probably haven't described it in a way that sounds super exciting but (laughs) it's so fun and like we're putting in like more gameplay elements where you know you have a certain amount of lives and you die if you don't do your shit so you, you got actual objectives and everything yeah 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 and oh, it's just cool. like a nice place to kind of like house my my stuff and there was one thing with like my old record label i was just like i really want to have like posters on the underground i think it was with welcome back to milk because i was just like if i saw someone wearing a merkin on the underground in london like i'd look them up even if i hated it um, yeah <laughs> and they were like well let's see how the record goes and then we'll advertise that <laughs> doesn't like, okay. So I, I built be... a billboard in the game advertising my new record. <laughs> <laughs> That's <is> awesome. <laughs> oh, there's also Let's... an sorry, there's also an art gallery in it and you can go in and you can use a QR code to like find the actual physical artwork and buy it. Oh, sweet. Yeah, okay. Let's that's it. awesome. That's I said that you know that seems kind of backwards. Let's let's not advertise and see how it does, and then we'll put some money into advertising. This is this is the thing which I think is super common with labels. And to go back to what we were saying about you know the the four year wait between those two records and why I don't get along with labels and stuff, it seems like a really common thing that they're all kind of like stuck to this sort of structure of like music in the 80s where there'd be like a a three-year album cycle and all of this you know promotion and stuff would happen which i think worked then but their budgets are so low now that they they're not paying for the promotion in between so you're just kind of like twiddling your thumbs eating a can of soup every day until you can put the next record out in the meantime people are putting stuff up constantly on soundcloud and kind of like keeping up with the consumption people are prepared for in the modern world yeah um and so for me there was always like a um a kind of like barrier to do it like i i would love to put out like two albums a year plus eps plus side projects yeah. and i just couldn't and it was just like this thing of having to go to someone to be like please can i release this thing and they're like not yet i was like i don't want you know and i think that a lot of the time people um think that they you know, that there's this sort of like this monetary aspect to signing with a label and definitely like upfront, they can put in funds that you don't have, but you're also tied to them for like 10, 15 years. Wow. Um, and Jeez. so you don't really make money anyway. So I was just like, I just want to put my shit out, have fun with it. I never really cared if it was going to be like 100 people or 10,000 people listening to the music. I just wanted okay. to put it out. So. And so that's how you started your own label release yeah. and it's your your own it's more like an art house isn't it because you're doing yeah. more than just records well because i so with my um music i always kind of like on the side have like sold my like illustrations and done graphic design and videos and all this stuff and i was kind of like it's getting a bit confusing because you know you might like go to my website and it's like you're looking for the music but then i'm like oh but there's also this tab of like my animated gifts or whatever and then I was, I think I decided I was like, I finally want to do like a clothing brand. And then Brad, who I'm working with, was just like, well, why don't you just make it into a record label as well? And I was like, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. So it's just kind of like everything I do. But I also really wanted to put sort of like limited edition runs of cassettes out of like people's music that I like, where it's just like oh, 50 neat. cassettes. They own all of their rights to everything and they get some like cool merch to go on tour with um that's awesome i also love limited edition stuff and like oh yeah yeah I, I would have a ton of it if i could i mean i've i've got a huge cd collection nice. but because that you know that was what was going on when i was 
able to start buying my own stuff. It was yeah. cassettes to start off with, and then once CDs came, yeah. there was so many more releases coming out on CDs. You know, totally. Bootlegs. And- yes. Well, I'm bootlegging my own record at the moment. Nice. Because I can. I won't tell you. <laughs> I I would be horrified. <laughs> no, I just like all of that kind of stuff. I was like, I'd love to just like sell like hand bin CDs in my record. And I couldn't do that with record label because they own the rights and I have to account to them. Wow. So it was just kind of like, yeah, I just, I, I love all of that, that kind of stuff. And we've done like five versions of the vinyl for this record, like oh, different wow. like, colors and stuff. That's um, awesome. It's just been like the most fun. And I think as well, like, I've I have like a big like vinyl collection, but like I've always loved, you know, like zines and like limited edition, like seven inches. And the feeling that I get when like there's someone whose music I love and I get this like physical memento and it's special because there's only five hundred or whatever. Yes. And it just sort of like connects you to them in a much more like human way. Like I love the smell of print. Like if I open up a book, I'll give it a big sniff. And it was the same thing yeah. as soon as I got my delivery of homecoming i was like what does it smell like (laughs) Um, and so yeah i just like i i really wanted to sort of create a place where i can like cultivate that for like me and my side projects but then also like friends and stuff so you ended up starting this new album in la right yeah and la kind of punched you in the face as soon as you got there (laughs) it did tell me what because you made an interesting friend (laughs) who helped after after your guitar was stolen. Yeah. So, so yeah. I want to hear about this story. Okay. <laughs> it's one of the weird, I mean, I've had like a lot of weird stuff happen to me, but so yeah, I went to LA and it was, I hadn't been for like a year and a half because I have this horrific fear of flying oh. Um, to the point where like I used to sort of like pass out if I had to even buy a plane ticket. It was a phobia, oh like a true phobia. Gosh. Wow. Um, and then so one day I was like, I've got to get over this. And then so I booked a flight for nine months in advance, which I never do. It was um, like a baby. Huh? It was like your airplane baby. Yeah, exactly. Yes, it was. My gestation period. <laughs> and then so I was like, okay, I've got like nine months to prepare or whatever. And then I was just like, you know, like I was coming to the end of my last record deal contract. And I was just like, maybe this is the time that I finally make what I want to make um so I, I went to LA to go and write the record and then I drove to San Francisco with my friend and on the way I called my friend who lives in San Francisco and I'd left a guitar there in his studio and then I texted him and I was just like oh um like I'm coming to pick up that guitar and he's like oh yeah it was like stolen a couple months ago and I was like what oh. <laughs> I couldn't well, believe I forgot it. to tell you yeah well that was good yeah and then so um and I loved that guitar and it's the one I played on Lung Bread for Daddy. And it was this this like 80s strat. And uh, I have weak fingers. So it was just like the action was really good and it was super easy to play. Anyway, oh. got stolen. So I was just like super bummed. And then it was kind of like Christmas time. And then like I didn't have anyone to like hang out with on Christmas Day. And I was just like super like down and like oh. Um, oh. and then my friend Ezra was playing a show at Largo. She was kind of like doing this like in between bit at this like Christmas comedy charity thing. And Jeff Garland was doing a, a set or whatever. I think he was like hosting or something. And then so we were backstage and we were all talking about music or whatever. And I didn't know that he was like a a big like rock fan. Like massive yeah, rock I, fan, huge guitar fan. I didn't realize that until I had done a little research and found this story because I know him from Goldbergs and Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, well, the thing was, okay, so I was in a relationship with a guy in LA years ago and it was this super like messed up relationship and he was like a gun collector and it was, we were just kind of like stuck in his house for three months in the dark eating chicken oh. wings. Um, <laughs> wow. Take out chicken is about him. And the thing that kept me going was Curb Your Enthusiasm. And Jeff was oh, my no. favorite character when that, oh, yeah. that woman was just like, Jeff, you fat fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like, I just loved it. And it was one of those things where like, you know, when like you're going through like a really bad time and there's a character on a show or a TV show that's just gotten you through some things. Like you always have like a place in your heart for it. 
So then oh, when yeah. I saw Jeff, I was like, <gasps> um, Did you call him a fat fuck? Yeah. No, no, I didn't. <laughs> nice to um, meet you, you fat fuck. You fat fuck. I wonder if people just ever say that to him. <laughs> I'm um, going to now yeah. if I ever meet him. <laughs> call him that beep, beep, beep. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, send me his number. I'll text him right now. Yeah. <laughs> And then so, yeah, we were talking about backst backstage and then Ezra had mentioned that my guitar was stolen. And then Jeff was like, wow, what kind was it? And I was just like, oh, it's a strap. Whatever. And then he was just like, meet me tomorrow at like whatever place. He was just like, we'll get you a guitar. And I was like, wow. what? And it was one of these things where it's just like, I, I don't like receiving big things like that from people because... I, I don't like knowing that I can't give something of equivalent value back. I understand that completely. Yeah. But then I was also in this place where I was just like, I don't have a guitar and I've come here to make this record or whatever. So he like gave me this amazing Strat, which is just the best guitar I've ever played ever. I didn't know anything about like um, custom guitars. I didn't know that they were hand wired and I just thought yeah. they were like, fancy expensive guitars but for no reason <laughs> um, and then the moment i played it i was like oh my god like the the pickups are really like hot and like you just you don't even have to have a pedal and it's just there's so much sustain um <sighs> and then i wrote undertaker It was kind of just the, the beginning of it. But I'm, yeah, I'm so grateful. He saved the album. And it's a really cool album. It's, yeah. it's wild because it's, it's 10 tracks and it's like 25 minutes long. I know. I had to call Brad and I was just like, will, will Spotify accept it as an album or is it going to go up as an EP? <laughs> 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 yeah, it's, because I thought it was probably 40 minutes. And then when I put them all together, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I got to write 10 more songs. Yeah. <laughs> so it goes all over the place in a, in a really cool way. It's like smoking me out is so trippy. <laughs> what in the hell is going on there? <laughs> I'd written, um, I'd written the chorus for that, which is pretty much like a sort of like poppy 60s, you know, it's just a, a pop song chorus or whatever. Yeah. And I really loved the chorus. And if I don't write an entire song in one, I really struggle to like write another section for it. Like I'm out of the mindset and I wanted it to be on the album. But like every time I wrote a verse, it just kind of sounded like a worse version of the chorus. Um, <laughs> and then I think it was like the day before we were mixing. And I was just like, I'm just going to like give it a, one more go. And then I, I was kind of like playing around with this like octave pedal on my voice, which initially I, I just dropped it one octave and I sounded the double of my brother, which is oh, wow. super weird because you wouldn't think that we have like the same voice, but obviously man's just an octave high. Anyway, and then so I think I was just kind of like testing the mic. I was just like, I'm just going to like do whatever comes out. And then this like nasty piece of shit came out. <laughs> And it was just like, <laughs> you sick fuck. Yeah. And then I just like kept going with it. And then the towel bit, I think, was like my mum was out at the time. And I think she told me to put like my laundry away for like washing because my mum's doing my laundry at the moment, which I'm really grateful for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and it was just kind of like, I really like the idea of, you know, like a shock rock alter ego where you can just be this like egotistical, nasty person. Um yeah, and then it just sort of came out, and then I just doubled it, and I was like, oh, that's all right, that'll work. 
Um, that, uh, you know. I was wondering because I'm like, what? Is, what the hell does that even mean? <laughs> A lot of it, it doesn't doesn't make any any sense. Another one of the songs on the record is "Ducky Daffy," makes no sense at all. <laughs> I, well, I like I like how you start the album with "Pull the Plug," which is essentially a phrase ending something. Yeah, oh yeah. I haven't thought about that. <laughs> I thought you were going to say plug. about the bit. Pretty much means somebody's dying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I can't remember. I think it was just probably about a relationship dying, which is what most of my songs are about. It's what most of my life is about. <laughs> well, oh, <okay. laughs> uh, my wife may hear that. I'm not going to talk about any of my old relationships. So. And let's just say I'm glad they're old relationships. Yeah. So I Can't Help You There is really cool. And I was not familiar with the farting suffragettes That's until then. That's so good. <laughs> I know that you've been feeling sorry for yourself, but baby, I can help you there. That kind of walk, that kind of talk, we'll see you fall. Yeah, baby, I can help you there. I'm getting out of this town, I'm getting back on the road. Pray like I'm going down, and say like I'm getting home. I know that you've been talking, spitting with your tongue, but baby, that's so good. That's, and I haven't even had a whole lot of time to check them out. I just think the name is, it'll stick with me forever. As it should. They're fucking great. <laughs> they they supported me at a show in Newcastle, which actually I think was probably my last show before all of this happened. Um, and I hadn't heard of them before. And they turned up and they just played this like great punk set. And then it was the kind of thing where sometimes you'll play a show and everyone's just kind of like slowly bobbing along. And you're like, I okay. really wish that they, like you know, like loosen up, whatever. And then just like the fighting suffragettes were just like all over the place, moshing and like <laughs> the singer sort of just was like topless. And I was just like, these people are fucking amazing. Like, it just, like, made my day because it was just, like, all you want to do when you play a show is, like, have fun. And they just kind of, like, forced everybody else to have fun. Um, That's great. And then I initially, like, I had, like, a whole list of people. I know that, like, I, it seems like I have quite a few guests on the record, but I wanted it to be, like, top to tail guests. Oh, um, yeah. And then so with I Can't Help You There, I was just, like, I really want this, like, raucous, like, nasty singing in the chorus and I was like the farting suffragettes <laughs> that, that yeah and it, it's such a cool song I think my favorite on the album though is I'm glad that we broke up ah uh, thank you that is so catchy that has been in my head for days now <laughs> I mean, when I wrote that, it wasn't intended to be a single. We just okay. kind of went with it. And I wrote it very quickly. I got Ezra to do her parts very quickly. But then in hindsight, I think it's one of my favorites as well. It's so catchy. It's ridiculous. Yeah, but isn't that the case? Those, these, these quick songs that become the ones that you, that you almost think are throwaways yeah. that become the ones that stick with everybody. Totally. But I find that with other people's records as well. This is, the, this is what I was going to say about your CD collection as well. It's just like you consume music in a completely different way when you are playing a physical album because you listen all the way through. You're not, yes. you know, you rarely have to like skip or whatever. And I think I learned so much about music and I broadened my musical horizon so much just by listening to like a full LP. Whereas now, yeah. like I, I stream a lot of music and, you know, I have my playlists or whatever. And, but when I was a kid, you know, I would hear a song like in the middle of a record and I'd be like, oh, you know, it's all right or whatever. And then after a year, it was my favorite one. Yeah. And you don't get to like have those slow build relationships with songs if you're not listening to them in that format. Exactly. Um, and I think that 
had a conversation with a guy recently and he's just like just release singles like fuck albums like albums are dead and i was like you will be well yes. one day <laughs> won't we all <laughs> um and then uh, <laughs> And then I just thought about it, it's just like, I'm up for like releasing some random singles or whatever, but there's something so beautiful about an album. I don't think they'll ever die. I hope not, because there's, like you said, you, know, you build relationships with them. I remember getting LPs, cassettes and CDs and just sitting in my room and reading the liner notes. Yes reading the lyrics and if they didn't have lyrics hopefully they had like a thank you list and i found some of my favorite bands by reading the people that these Same. bands that i like thanked well this is also i think uh, another thing i really loved about like the 60s west coast scene was like if you read the liner notes on a bunch of those records they've got all sorts of people from different bands in the community playing on the records and it's like oh yeah that's why i got into music like i loved the idea of like I have some side projects at the moment and it's just like people from like all over and just the idea of like sharing that experience with different people is so fun, which is probably why I had like a lot of guests on this one. You have some amazing guests. I mean, all right. Two of my favorite artists of the 90s through the 2000s, Shirley Manson and Andy Bell. Yeah. I mean, Garbage is incredible. Yeah. And Ride. And, and, and you know, Andy also was also part of Oasis. Yeah, yeah. How did you get those guys involved? Um, well, so I, I've known Shirley for like a few years. She had written like a, it was like some interview or something in Elle magazine. And they're like, okay. who's your like favorite new artist or whatever? And she'd written about me and someone had wow. sent it to me. And I was like, oh, that's funny. It looks like Shirley's like writing this thing. But like, I, it was so far from like my idea of reality that I was like, well, <laughs> but that's not what's happening. And then I kind of like looked into it and I was like, holy fuck. Um, <laughs> and she just written this like lovely thing about Welcome Back to Milk. Um, and then we ended up just becoming friends. And then we toured with them, with Garbage, um, did their like UK and Europe tours. It was like 2019. But she's just fucking great. She's just like a great friend to have. She's very, she's very thoughtful, but she's also very like scary and boisterous, but like in a way where she'll be like, keep your chin up, you dick. Well, she's Scottish, right? <laughs> yeah. There she wouldn't actually say keep, keep your chin <laughs> up, you <laughs> dick. But like, um, she was like a real <laughs> great help to me throughout sort of like a lot of the, the issues that I was having in the music industry. She's just like a really great person to talk to. And yeah. we sort of talked about doing something together and then when i wrote medicated I, it just had such like a 90s vibe it does um yeah it's one reason i love it thank you funny because i i wasn't into the 90s growing up because i was a 90s child and i was like this sucks yes. um, and then now that i'm an old man i'm like oh yeah it was quite good uh, oh, wait. <laughs> I, I, i'll be honest with you i loved grow i love being the age that i was in that time yeah i bet it, it was really cool because you had so many things it wasn't you didn't have the music wasn't as easily accessible mm -hmm. back then as it was now but i kind of liked that because it was a hunt you had yeah. to search for things. You would find yeah. all kinds of weird stuff. That's the other thing about records is like I I looked for stuff so much more. And then when you discover it, you have this kind of like not ownership over it. That sounds very controlling. But it's like, like an investment. Yeah, totally. And it's like I've worked to find this. Now I yeah. will listen. Whereas like when, you know, a streaming service goes like, this is your daily suggestion from us. You're like, I'll give it a listen. Yeah, exactly. And what I found for me, and I don't know if anybody else feels this way, but for me, when I had to spend, and we had a really cool record store close to my house. Yeah. It was, Princeton University was, was not too far from where I grew up in New Jersey. Yeah. And they had a big college radio station. And so they would get tons of promo CDs <gasps> and they would just unload them on this one local record store called the Princeton Record Exchange. <laughs> and me and my buddy Ed would go there like every two, three weeks yeah. with and these promos, they'd put them out for sale for like, you know, a, a dollar yeah. to like 
five bucks or so. So you go in with 20, 30 bucks and you can come out with 15 albums. Ah, that's amazing. But, but between that or, you know, just buying a, a regular CD off the shelf for, you know, f at the time, 15, 18 bucks. Yeah. You're spending your money in it. And even if you didn't like it to start with, I'm playing it over and over yeah, and over because I with. bought this. Exactly. For sure. So, and then, that. like you're saying, a song you didn't like may grow on you. Yeah. And I don't think that happens much anymore. No. Because you, you don't and have to sad. keep listening. Yeah. It is. So how did you end up getting Andy Bell on the album? Andy was... So I was... At this point, I had gotten back to London and I was doing all of the, I kind of like demoed everything in LA and then I set up a studio in my bedroom. Um, and this was just before the pandemic shut everything this down, was, right? Um, it had already started shutting down. Wow. So um, I, my, I'd sort of thought about recording at home and I was like, no, I should really go to a professional. And then, uh, then I couldn't, so I was like, oh, I've got to teach myself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then, so, uh, yeah, I just kind of, this, like, rudimentary studio, I recorded everything on my, my 2014 laptop. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, so I was just in my room, and um, I, Andy and his friend had been in touch to, about this other side project or whatever where I had to do vocals. Um, and then I was in the middle of, recording and i needed bass on all the way so i did bass on most of the record and then my friend jorgen jorgensen of ezra's band also did some bass but i was like well this one needs like i had like an idea of the bass that i wanted which was kind of like someone playing bass like a lead instrument and then so like i was okay. emailing them about stuff and like in the back of my head i was just like i'm running out of time because i gave myself this like stupid deadline because i can't stick to anything <laughs> <laughs> and then I was just like, well, while I'm doing these vocals, do you mind putting bass on this track? And he was like, yeah, sure. And then he sent it the next day and I was like, this is, um, I mean, not that it's shocking. He's a great bass player. <laughs> no, that's, that's a pretty quick turnaround. It's super quick. But I think he was just at home making his stuff as well. <laughs> so it's just like a really like lovely exchange apart for a part. Wow. And it just like really made the song, I feel like, and we put it super high in the mix because it's just that sort of like meandering, like harmonic bass line. Um, and it, it brought it all together. And then only after that, I was like, oh, I've got like Andy Bell on my song. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is, that's, man, I, yeah. I'm just, see, I've always, I've loved Ride and the stuff he did with Oasis. Yeah. It was just incredible. So mm -hmm. I've, I've been a huge fan of his. And, Obviously, surely. Ezra, I'm kind of just getting to know, but yeah, I'm really yeah, yeah. liking her stuff. Yeah. Well, so I, I met her like years and years ago because we, I think my mom just dropped a shampoo bottle. Did you hear that? <laughs> yes. And I'm keeping it in. <laughs> She's like creeping in. This is because I did like a radio thing the other day and I was just like, <laughs> and then like her phone has like <laughs> the loudest ring so that she can like hear it when it's downstairs and it's like, ring. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I I actually love that kind of stuff. Yeah. I keep that. I keep all that crap in. Well, she's running a bath now, so you can you can record that as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, oh, what was oh Ezra? Yeah, Ezra is what I think everybody should listen to Ezra Furman forever. She's just like growing up. I loved you know like Bruce Springsteen, Elton John, David Bowie, Lou Reed, all of these people who just write these amazing, almost kind of like novel as in a novel in a song yeah and she just does the same thing and they're so catchy and it's just like some people can just like write a five hits in a day and they're like mm, i guess that's okay yeah. and you're like what the fuck yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> i could do that like. once yeah yeah you should also Man. get her on your podcast because she's fucking hilarious i'm open to anybody you can throw my way right when you so. have some time <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Once I get this time thing down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she's in America. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. 
I still got to get the time thing yeah. down. <laughs> Well, I really loved the album. It was so, it, unfortunately, it was over before I knew it. So, so I just started over. That, so I've been listening to it a lot. Plan. You've got kind of a cool mix of, of stuff. You've got the lo-fi, yeah. you've got the ballady stuff, you know, Take Me Away. It's just really, really wide variety of, of sound and styles on it. It's, it's really, a really fun listen. Thanks. I'm, I, I like to... I always end with this sad song. I I've want people that. to walk away being upset. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's... So you start off with pull the plug mm -hmm. and then you end with a sad song. Yeah. <laughs> That's the plan. No, I like having like a variety of different songs. I'm trying to, the more I make records, I'm trying to do like a record per genre or a genre per record so that, because okay. I used to be a lot more wild with that, but now I'm like, I really want to do like a happy hardcore record after this. Rather than putting happy hardcore next to rock into one album, I don't want to confuse okay. people too much. Well, yeah. Yeah. Are you gonna have, are you going to go back to the strange names or are you going to Let's keep a little see. more? I'm definitely going to stick to shorter names, I think, because my, my birth name, Beth Jean Houghton, is a real fucker to have to write down on like, <laughs> when I'm like signing <laughs> forms and stuff. And yeah. then Beth Jean's Houghton in the Who's of Destiny, also a nightmare. Like when I have, to, I had to do like the artwork for the albums and I'd be like, oh my God, it's, it's like 190 characters. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. And also cause I, I did the handburn CDs and I was like writing, you know, like take one for the team, you know, in the list of songs. I'm just like, my hand hit. <laughs> so look so out for one word titles. I've got the exact opposite problem. My entire name is eight letters. Is it? Oh yeah, it is. Yeah, you don't have a middle name. I don't name. have. Don't have a middle name. Do you wish I'm you actually did? a second. My dad is has the same name, and my son's the third. So wow. we should we should probably all be serial killers at this point. But you should. Do you have um? Right. Do you do you put second down when you write your name? Only if it's like a super legal document, like oh. my mortgage. I think that because you should uh, you should really get on that. It sounds I, so official. I, That'd be regal. Yeah. Be pretty real. Maybe I can take Harry's place in in the on the monarchy. Funny that we now share a royal couple. Yeah, it's strange. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if I consider Meghan Markle very royal. <laughs> She's a little it Did you see like that a interview? lot of other people don't also. Damn it. <laughs> I saw literally about two minutes of that interview and it was basically Harry saying something and Meghan was like, shut up. Wait, I didn't see that part. Me and my mom watched like an hour of it. I think as well because like we grew up with like Diana and stuff and yeah. like having seen how certain people from outside are treated, it was very much kind of like, uh... You kind of, you, you were just waiting for the shoe to drop? <laughs> well, it was just kind <laughs> of like, I, I don't blame them for leaving at all. Yeah. I can understand it. Yeah. It's just... Don't tell me how hard it was, you know, you're still making a shit ton of money. Yeah, but also, but the thing is about that, because I saw someone had been like, you know, oh, she was locked up and like, oh, I live in this council house and blah, blah, blah. But I think in terms of that, it, you've got to look at like the human sort of psychological side. Because that can oh, yeah, yeah. to anybody, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and that that's horrible. It is. Also, but... I know a lot of rich people and a lot of them are very unhappy. <laughs> That, yeah, I can see that. I, I, and I, that's the thing. I think I could be a pretty happy rich person. I just need that opportunity. <laughs> I think I'd be really unhappy <laughs> because a lot of when I'm not feeling creative, I have to be anyway because I need to pay my rent. And if I, yeah. I really don't know how badly being rich would affect my output and making stuff is what like keeps me going see i have the opposite i think it would help me out because <laughs> being a f one of the things I've, I've i mean i'm a photographer for years and i love it doing it yeah one of the things i got into bef right before the pandemic hit was i, I started doing it and publishing my stuff more yeah, yeah yeah and i started shooting live concerts which has always been a passion i always love that because yeah, i guess so music's always been a huge part of my life so Combining the two was just a natural, and I yeah. I loved it. So if if I had unlimited income, it didn't have to worry about my mortgage. Yeah, I'd be doing that. 
Yeah, yeah, totally. That makes sense. I think. And that would make me happy. Yeah, I can see that. Because you got a family. Yeah. I'm just me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, need, I do need a stable income at this point. Yeah. I got three about to hit college, so. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, Ooh. my my oldest is, she's well on, she's got a, a path already. She knows what she wants to do. She took nursing classes in, oh, in wow. high school. She's about to graduate. And she's going to take, she's going to go to a local community college for two years, get her core classes done yeah. before she transfers and to focus on nursing. But she's already got her certified uh, nurse's assistant certificate. Wow. And she's actually today, she's working, she's at a hospital working, she's <gasps> doing a 12 hour shift. So wow. she's 18. That's amazing. I know. Oh, you she's... must be very proud. Oh, it, my heart just bursts every yeah. time I talk about it. And also and... a relief, I guess, because it's just like, that's all you want for your that's... kids. That's her passion. That's yeah. that's what she she wants to do, and 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 so my wife and I have been supporting her consistently through that, and even through the pandemic. You know, yeah. you, you, you're scared. It's your kid. You know, you're scared. I don't want anything bad to happen, but yeah. you know, this is what she wants to do. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, she's in high school with a job at the local hospital right now. It's just blows. She's so much more focused than I was at her age. That's amazing. I've but I've, I've seen like a lot of this in like kids and like younger people these days. There's so much more grown up and like aware of all sorts of things like the need to save money and like aware of like mental health and yeah um you know standing up for what's right and recycling yeah. and just like all of this shit that like when i was a kid it was just like you were uncool if you recycled and you were a vegetarian it's just like now you're uncool if you're not <laughs> yeah <laughs> and that's so i think the ex exposure with the internet you know for all the bad it does it it does do some good oh definitely you know? like the access to different things um and yeah. the awareness that they have of things definitely and of different yeah just amazing like i i downloaded tiktok recently because i was like oh, i should probably have a tiktok account whatever and like i thought it was just going to be loads of people doing those funny dances <laughs> and it kind of is but there's also like loads of like young kids doing these short kind of like lessons on like lgbtq history and yeah i was it's like this is amazing they're educating it's... themselves and everyone else in a format that young people um like engage with well yeah it's amazing yeah it, it, it's you know I, I thought the same thing it was just going to be a whole bunch of people dancing yeah but my oldest daughter she gets uh cooking tips yeah. and recipes off that yeah and my son my son is huge into electronic my son loves anything old tech so okay. anything from like that he loves cars from like the 70s yeah. he re he actually tears apart and rebuilds old tvs wow it's insane he, i mean yeah. if he if he could get a, an eight track player he would be thrilled yeah yeah, like, yeah yeah you have like four options for music on on an eight track yeah. <laughs> nobody's doing eight track but he yeah. wants one it's yeah and then, it's it's so fun. I, I just got overwhelmed thinking of all of the opportunities he has in his life of the things that he can do just knowing how to take part of TV. Oh, yeah. Like, and, it's, and he's so, so good at it. Yeah. And my youngest is just, she's just, she loves science and she wants to be uh, an anthropologist. Oh, wow. I'm like, go for God. it. So, also so interesting that they all have such kind of like different interests. Yeah, it's so, and, and they're all, you know, they're, there's, um, uh, is it 11 months between my first two and 10 between the second yeah, two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The second and the third. And they're just so, so different. It's yeah. amazing. Wow. So. Never, never boring. No, never. That's great. Just like your music. Aww. Never boring. Yeah. One is an so, anthropologist. So, <laughs> <laughs> so where can people find the album? How can they pick it up? They can pick it up on, I sell them on my website. Um, but you can also just get them in like record stores or whatever. And we actually like, we ordered like a bunch of vinyl and I was like, well, this is going to last me like the next two years or whatever. And then we already sold out. Um, wow. So we're having a bit of an issue because like, apparently like vinyl is cool again. And so a lot of the major labels are taking up all of the manufacturing time. Oh, wow. So it's kind of like you go to like order records and they're like, well, we can get it to you in like 2023. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh not 2023 right, well, but like end of the year anyway so I'm, yeah there's my a website, place which there's a place by me that actually produces vinyl really yeah you should check it out it's called blue sprocket i will what a good name 
Yeah, Wait, it's in what Virginia. Is a sprocket? So it's the little geared piece. It's like the two yeah. gears go together. It's it's the part with the teeth. Oh, that cool. Yeah. <laughs> Do you ever hear about the um that old the the two thousand year old computer? What? <laughs> so I'm no. gonna get this entirely wrong. So everyone must fact check. But they found, I think in like 1901, they found this shipwreck in Greece that had this thing on it. And they're like, oh shit, this is like the earliest analog computer ever made. And it's 2000 years old. And so basically, I don't know if like the ship was like attacked by pirates, aliens, who knows. But it went down and it changed the course of history because we would have had technology like way earlier. Wow. Your, your little sprocket air diagrams that made me think of that oh man um <laughs> but yeah also like the records on band camp uh to go back to what we were talking about <laughs> yeah um, I, I, I go up on tangents too it's so do whole... i it's like a really big issue for me and i'm trying to like rein it in because my brain is just not linear it just goes off in all of these <laughs> different directions um but yeah it's on like all streaming platforms etc you buy them from me though it helps me keep going as a musician because they get a bigger percentage there you go <laughs> yeah <laughs> is there a social media following or, or yes. presence i should say uh on instagram it's at uh do dot blonde with an e and i'm on twitter and all of those things also on tiktok i have like 13 followers so please <laughs> make me feel better <laughs> <laughs> oh man i know i'm out of the age bracket but we can see so, yeah <laughs> there's no age bracket for me on tiktok <laughs> you know there's no 47 year old age bracket i actually found a guy on tiktok the other day who he's called like aggressive reactions and he's <laughs> just like have you seen I've him? seen that dude yes he's just he's like, awesome you fucking keep your chin up you're fucking amazing yeah. And you're like, yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Just so yes. good. Yeah, really great. But yeah, and my, what's, what's the website so people can actually order directly from um, you? www.dublond.co.uk. I think. All right. I'm just right. like I should. I should just check. Yeah. <laughs> that's the you know, website. No, I ask that, and nobody knows. Nobody knows their websites. It's like my uh, phone number. I don't. I don't if I if I had to call my kids, yeah, I'd be screwed because I just look them up by their name. I know. Okay, so we have this soap in England called Coronation Street. Have you heard of okay. it? It's yes, the, it's the longest running soap ever. I think it's been going for sixty years, and they put out like six episodes a week. Um, Jeez. So I got really into this. It's not the kind of thing that me and my mum would ever watch, but in recent years we've become addicted. But there was this scene in this recent episode where. This uh, character who's pregnant is locked in um, like the back office of the supermarket and she can't get out. And then she goes into labor and like her phone's dead and it's all like, God, what's Grace going to do? And then she picks up the phone, like the, the home phone of the office or whatever, and then just like dials her boyfriend's number. Then she dials her boyfriend's uncle's number and you're like, how do you know that? Oh. It's 2021. Of course. You know. <laughs> well, I was like, I can look up by your name. I don't know yeah, your number. Just like, oh, seven, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, you know, it's funny because I used to be able to rattle off my buddies. My one, my, my friend, his, uh, he actually lives in the house he grew up in. His, his parents passed away and he inherited the house. Yeah. So he's had the same phone number his entire freaking life. I can't remember it. I've known this guy for like 40 years. And I used to call him all the time on on the push button yeah, phone, yeah, yeah. and I knew his number by heart. I don't remember it. I remember it. my my home phone for anyone who wants it because it doesn't exist yeah. anymore is oh one nine one two six nine for the apps. The first phone number that I can remember is when I was when well, the first time I lived in Virginia when I was like in second, like, however old you are up until like third fourth grade. Like seven zero three seven five four nine five nine eight. I can barely remember my my number on my new phone, but I I got that one down. That's yeah. It's a, it's funny what you remember. I was actually talking to my friend the other day because I had this incident with an ex boyfriend once where where he'd like he'd done a shit in this toilet, and I went in to after start. him, and it was too big to flush. <laughs> and then so like 
I'm a very caring person. I didn't want him to be embarrassed. And then, <laughs> also, I was like really young and I, I didn't know what to do. I was just like, the worst thing I could think of was like for him to realize that he'd done such a massive shit that it blocked the toilet. <laughs> so I like, and also he didn't have a plunger. So I wrapped oh. my, I wrapped my hand in tissue and just kind of like sliced up his shit with my hand. <laughs> I went to flush it, but like because I used so much tissue paper, like the toilet blocked. And then I still didn't want him to be embarrassed, so I told him I'd blocked the toilet and that he didn't let me, let me live it down. But then, so I was talking to my, this happened like 10 years ago. And then I was oh talking my to my gosh. friend yesterday, and she was like, You know how you have like those memories that just sort of, you've got five or six memories that throughout life they just kind of float into your head? And I was like, Yes. And she was just like, That's one of them for me. <laughs> <laughs> Just like imagines me like yeah. Oh my god, that's the perfect that. story to end this on. <laughs> yes. Also I just thought, what if people can Google my my house by Googling that number? You might want to bleep out my home phone number. There you go. I can do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I don't care about my number because that's somebody else's house now. Oh that's great. Yeah, this is my mom's so. precious home. Well, thank you so much. I've, you. I've kept you quite a while this morning, so oh, thank no, you. Oh, no, it's fine. Oh, I'm glad. I've had a blast. Yeah, me too. I've been trying my best to keep it together. Light as a feather and stiff as a board and lonely as right on. I got my sights on that open door. I could run or I could take one for the team. But this time tomorrow, I won't be breathing, believe. Okay, please just go away, no need to tell